We're going to begin our uh, message this morning. It's on the Sermon 2 of the series we're doing entitled Home Improvement. And, uh, but before we begin that, I heard a joke this week from a, a doctor friend of mine, and I'm gonna, it's, it kind of is like Valentine's. So I'm not always really good at telling jokes, but I'm going to attempt this. So uh, I, I'll probably mess it up, but anyway. Um, there was these three dogs, and they were walking down the sidewalk. They all met at the fire hydrant. One was a giant, beautiful German Shepherd. The other was a big collie, kind of like Lassie. And the third one was a little Mexican Chihuahua, and he was just really small. Well, this really good-looking toy poodle girl dog came walking by and kind of winked at them all and, and of course their mouths are all drooling and, and uh, the dog, they said, hey, can we go out with you? And she said, well, if you guys could come up with a good statement that uses the words liver and cheese, then maybe I'll go out with one of you. So the, the German shepherd goes, well, I hate liver and cheese. And she goes, well, you're definitely not it then. <laughs> the big German shepherd goes, I love liver and cheese. She goes, oh, you could probably do better than that. The little chihuahua goes, leave her alone, boys. Cheese all mine. <laughs>
He's also involved in building a place for our faith, the church. He said, on this rock, I will build my church. And then thirdly, he's interested in building a home for your family. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain who build it. Who build it. You know, a wedding ceremony is a piece of cake, really. It just takes a few minutes. But marriage and family will take you a lifetime. A wedding is an event. But a good family and a good marriage is an accomplishment. A key component to building a good marriage and a strong family is you must have a good, firm foundation. You must have a good foundation. When Solomon built the temple, the Bible says he built it out of rocks that were quarried from the underneath the city of Jerusalem. In fact, the Bible says that they built it without the sound of a hammer. They went down into those rock quarries and carved out these massive stones, these stones that became the foundation for Solomon's temple. When I was in Israel a year, nearly two years ago, I saw some of those massive stones below the temple there, and you could not even slip a piece of paper in there. They, they, they made them so perfectly. Solomon knew the importance of a good, godly foundation in a marriage, and as he wrote the, the verse that we just read there in Psalm 127, 1, that unless the, the Lord builds a house, the workers labor in vain. The title of this message this morning, our second of the series, is A Firm Family Foundation. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 to 25. We looked at this last Sunday. We're going to look at it again. Genesis 2, 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But there still was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, This one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. These verses, verses teach us about the first family. They teach us how we can build a firm family foundation. And I want to give you three basic building blocks upon which to build a solid family foundation. Building block number one is you must have a God-oriented foundation. A God-oriented foundation. Verse 18 teaches us that in order to have a good family, you have to have a God-oriented foundation. The key phrase is, I will make. Verse 18, then the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make. The first family was formed by God. He is the power and the authority of the family. We must have an adequate authority for the value system of our family. Someone or something determines your decisions and the values that you hold to in your family. It must be a godly authority. What values do you want your family to stand for? What authority will make your decisions? Some base it on the culture around them. Others based it on the culture in which they were brought up. In other words, the home and however they were raised is often repeated by your own family. Now, this is great if you have a Christian God-oriented family. If you have a family grown like that, then you have a leg up and on others and thank God every day for it. My experience was like that. I grew up in a Christian home. I never knew what it's like not to have a mom or a dad that loved Jesus, went to church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday school, every time there was anything, we were there. And I praise God for that today. 
However, I've also seen people that are brought up that way that, that turn from that and, and their families later wonder what happened. Well, my prayer to you is and my advice is just keep praying for them. The seed has been planted. You raise them right. God will not violate a person's free will. Just keep praying and believing for the Lord for that harvest to come in. Now, if you didn't grow up in a, in a Christian home, you will, you will have to determine that you and the Lord are going to do it different. That's what happened with my father. My father, my father's parents divorced when he was five. He had a little brother that was three and a little sister that was one when his parents divorced. And he was moved all over the countryside, up to Idaho, back to Oklahoma, up to Idaho, back to Oklahoma. Several, several times. Sometimes living with mom. Sometimes living with dad. Sometimes living with grandma. Sometimes living with Uncle uh, Sonny. And sometimes living with a neighbor. He never knew where he was going to live. I don't know how many schools he went to in his first, uh, you know, through high school. He attended numbers and numbers of high schools and schools. When my mom and my dad were married after they became a Christian, my dad said these words, I will not raised my family the way I was raised. He said, I'm not going to repeat the mold. I'm not going to repeat what happened to me. He said, I'm going to do it different because I would not raise boys or girls the way I was raised. I praise God for that. So sometimes you have to say, it's going to be different. For instance, if your family was built on materialism and possessions were the most important thing in your family, that's a bad problem to follow. If in your home was alcohol and drugs, that's a bad choice to follow. It bothers me when you go into a restaurant, there's mom and dad sitting there drinking alcohol and little Joey and little Susie drinking, uh, you know, Coke. What are, what are they doing? What kind of a pattern are they putting into place in those children? And their choices bring untold suffering upon themselves and the children they raise. Maybe in your family there was a lot of fussing and quarreling and fighting. And you saw family arguments, and whoever yelled the loudest got their way. If that's all you ever saw, then you would think that's the way to do it. But it's a poor pattern to follow. That may be the culture you came from. You may have to decide, like my father did, no, it's going to be different for me. Amen. Others turn to the culture they see around them in the world. They allow the media or the so-called standards of the world and the standard of so-called celebrities to serve as their basis for their own standards. The media elite in America today are making a concerted effort to destroy family life as we know it and as it ought to be. The culture is doing everything in its power to undermine and totally destroy the biblical foundation for the family. The standard in today's culture is the Osbournes, the Simpsons, and the Bunkers. The world would have you believe that's the way a family's supposed to be. The whole idea of mocking morality and belittling the institution that God put in place called marriage and family. I remember back in December, constantly, one of the, the good family channels called ABC Family. How many have heard of ABC Family? You know what they were doing constantly in December? Now remember, in January, we're changing our name to Freeform. Drifting away because it was more culturally acceptable to not be associated with family. One of the trends among so-called celebrities today is for women to have babies and not be married. That's the end thing now. Just pick out a guy and have a baby. A baby becomes an accessory, like a piece of jewelry. You have a diamond ring and a diamond necklace, and now you have a baby on your side. Isn't that so cool? No, it's not cool. Lord, help us. We've drifted so far as a nation. No wonder our children get mixed up, commit horrible crimes, and even sometimes suicide because of the values that's espoused in our culture. We have to take a stand against that. We have to show them there's a better way. If the world and the modern culture is your, and the modern family is your plumb line, your authority, you are headed for difficult days. The Bible says we reap what we sow. And you know what you do? You always reap more than you sow. 
You always reap more. Hosea 8, 7 says, They have planted the wind and have reaped what? Does anybody know? The, world. the whirlwind. We planted just the wind, but what we've reaped is the whirlwind. What we've rip, rip, reaped is a tornado of terrible things happening in our society. We see a whirlwind of violence and immorality that is like that of Sodom and Gomorrah. We know what God did about that. Church, we need to hit our knees and we need to pray. And we need to pray for this nation and pray that God will bring it back around again. Amen. A firm family foundation is a God-oriented foundation. Because it's God's idea. Therefore, we must look to the Bible for the principles, the precepts, and the promises that we can follow to make a fantastic family. We must get our convictions our values, our standards, our directions from what the Bible says, not from what anyone else in culture says. He must be the authority upon which our home is built. Jesus clearly tells us this in the parable of the wise and the foolish builders at the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. Remember the story? He said somebody built their house, these people built their house on the sand, the others built their house on the rock. The winds came, the waves came. How I many you know wind and waves come on no matter what kind of foundation you're built on? The righteous and the unrighteous have storms in their life. But the foundation that was made of sand, the house came down with a great crash. But the foundation that was upon the rock, it stood through the wind and through the rain and through the storm. So first of all, we must have a God-oriented foundation. Secondly, we must have a goal-oriented foundation. In verse 2, or excuse me, verse 24 of Genesis 2 says, This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. We talked about this a lot more last Sunday. The goal of this marriage and the family is unity. It's togetherness. It's oneness. The goal is to leave and to leave and to cleave. Leave and cleave. Not beaver. Not beaver cleaver. Leave and cleave. Alright? We are to leave our parents behind our previous family behind, and we begin a new family. Now, what does that mean? That means you're never supposed to talk to mom and dad again? No, that's not what it means. There's a sense in which you never leave your previous family. I read a story here a while, a while back that when a, a man and a woman climb into bed every night, there are six people who get in that bed. There's the man and his father and mother, and the woman and her father and mother. Because of all the teaching and the, the culture in which they were raised. So actually for the rest of your life you will be affected by the kind of family you came from and the family your spouse came from. How you relate to one another and solve problems is in a lot of ways determined by your upbringing. We mentioned that earlier. You don't literally break ties with your family or never speak to them, but you begin a new family, a new marriage. It's your family. The goal is unity in that marriage. Which means you have to cut some strings from your family. You need to cut the financial strings. Strings of dependency. Now it's not to say parents can't help out their children from time to time. I praise God for my parents and grandparents over the last 35 years nearly that Carol and I have been married. There have been times they've helped us. There have been times they've done things for us and that's okay. But I don't depend on them every month. If I had to depend on my dad every month to make my house payment, he'd probably say, son, maybe you shouldn't have got married. You know? you got to cut those strings. you got to cut that dependency. And moms and dads, you must let them go. Don't pressure them. Sometimes it's the parents that have a harder time with letting the kids go than the kids. Mom and dad, you didn't lose a son. You gained a... A daughter. And you didn't gain a daughter. I mean, you didn't lose a daughter. You gained a, a son. Parents must respect the newly formed family and give them their space. At holiday times, they 
vacation time, where they live, where they work, whether they have kids or not, or how many. We need to back off. Sometimes couples go through the horrendous stress just trying to please everybody at holiday time. And you know what I'm talking about. We gotta go here, we gotta go here because somebody's gonna get mad. We're not there at a certain time. Parents, back off! Back off! If they're here, great. If they're not, great. It's okay. I've been there and done that. Parents may tune into this. I'm sorry, Mom and Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Watching my video. All right. I love my parents. But don't put your spouse in the middle. And when you have kids, it's spouse and then kids. Sometimes people may have kids and then later on the, the spouse becomes second place and the kids get in the spouse's place. And that causes nothing but problems too. The word clean carries the idea of compatibility. Husbands and wives are not automatically compatible. Here is a couple and they get married and think they are so compatible. They enjoy being with one another. They think they are loading up and sailing away on the love boat. If that be true, a lot of couples feel like they missed the boat. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, we're always not going to be compatible. Cecil Osborne said this, The difficulty of achieving a happy marriage is compounded by the fact that men and women are basically incompatible. They have goals, needs, emotions, and drives which are incompatible with those of the opposite sex. We are basically incompatible. It takes a lifetime to, of marriage to develop compatibility. Same thing is true when children are born. They are all different. Here are two children. They have the same mother and the same father, and they are as different as night and day. I have a brother that's 20 months younger than me, and we are both as different as night and day. We're completely opposites. Have the same mom, same dad, raised in the same house. I'm a lot better looking than he is. <laughs> So you have to cleave together. Just kidding, Roger. You have to cleave. That takes total commitment. The number one requirement for a strong family is commitment. Turn to your neighbor and say it's commitment. <laughs> commitment. When you are when you marry, you are committed to that other person. When you have children, you are committed to them and you love them. Every family member must be precious to you. No, no favorites. That causes problems. Another whole story. We must strive to talk and live with one another. Answer this question. This has got a big star by it, so tune in. Ask yourself this question. Don't answer it out loud. You might embarrass yourself. What is life like for my spouse having to live with me? Don't look at your spouse. You might get the evil eye. What is life like for my spouse having to live with me? Second question. Here's another. What is life like for my children having to live with me? Now, kids, all the teenagers and children, listen to this one. What is life like for my parents having to live with me? What is life like having to live with those that we love? We need to try to make there as much harmony and unity and compatibility and commitment and blessing as can be. We talked about this a lot last Sunday. We know what sets off our spouse. We know what gets us. Don't say it. Don't let those words come over your lips if you know it's going to make them go into orbit. So a strong, firm family foundation must be, number one, God-oriented, number two, goal-oriented, and thirdly, a firm family foundation must be grace-oriented. Isn't that right, Grace? <laughs> I think she'd like this version. This, this one. 
Uh, Genesis 2, 25 says, The man and his wife were both naked. They felt no shame. Now, wouldn't it be great if there was a verse 26 that said, And they all lived happily ever after. <laughs> My Bible doesn't say that. Why? It doesn't say that because right after chapter 2 of Genesis comes chapter 3 where sin comes into the human race. Man becomes a sinner. Woman becomes a sinner. One of the things you have to understand to have a family, a firm family foundation is that we are all sinners. You married a sinner. Your spouse married a sinner. That's true even in Christian families. Moms and dad may be saved and all the children may be saved. You all may be saved, but you are also still sinners. Christian dads battle temptation. Christian dads make mistakes. Christians moms struggle and blow it sometimes. Christians boys and girls and young people act like pagans sometimes. Because we're all sinners. We need a Savior, not just on the day we're saved, but every day. Something else. We are not only all sinners, we are also all selfish. When the Lord confronted Adam, what did he do? It's that woman you gave me. She did it. And what did the woman do? The snake did it. And then Adam took it a, 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 a degree further. He said it, I already said it, I gave it away. It's that woman. You gave me. It's your fault, God. We all blame somebody else and refuse to take responsibility. But notice in Genesis 3.21, it says, Then the man, Adam, named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. In verse 21, And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. That's a picture of salvation. That's a picture of grace. Grace covered their nakedness and grace covered their sin. A family where grace is understood makes all the difference in the world. Grace means getting what you don't deserve. You know what, mer you know what mercy means? Mercy means not getting what you do deserve. That's the difference between grace and mercy. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. They're very similar, but different. When my kids were growing up, every now and then they'd get in trouble. And I would discipline them, ground them, or sometimes get the paddle and spank them. I still believe that's okay. Some psychologists... Psychologists today believe that spanking damages your kids. No, not spanking damages your kids. That's what the Bible says. It's not, that's not what I said. That's what the Bible says. Anyway, sometimes I would all of a sudden think, okay, I'll just give them grace. Get ready to spank them and say, well, you know, you really deserve this, Caleb. <laughs> You didn't need to punch Kelsey and Cammy. You deserve a spanking, don't you? Woo -hoo. <laughs> but Caleb, I'm going to give you grace today. You know what that means? That means I'm not going to give you. I mean, I'm going to give you something you don't deserve. I'm going to give you mercy. I'm not going to give you what you do deserve. I'm going to give you grace. I'm not going to give you a spanking because I want you to remember what the word grace is. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sometime later, probably the next day. <laughs> gets in trouble again. Talking to him. Dad? <clears throat> yes. You got any more grace? <laughs> Are we out of grace? <laughs> See, my dad did that to me, so I'm just passing along. In fact, my dad took it one step further one time. I think I've told you this before. Instead of me spanking, him spanking me, he handed me the paddle and says, now, you spank me. I'm going to take your spanking for you. 
We're crying. No, we can't do that, Dad. You didn't do anything wrong. I know, son, but I'm going to take your spanking for you. You know, I'm all crying about it. My brother says, give me the power. <laughs> I told you we were opposites. Where's it at? And I want to read it out of the King James Version. It's the parable of the lost son. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of the goods that follow to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, there, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent them into his fields to feed swine. And he would have fain filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and here I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am not worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was again a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and fell and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fat calf and, and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. They began to be married. This prodigal son had one of the greatest boys, one of the greatest fathers a boy could ever have. In fact, I'll tell you, do you know the short story, the short version of this story? Can I give you like the, the ultimate reader's digest version of the prodigal son? Here it is. He sold his coat to buy food. He sold his shirt to buy food. He sold his undershirt to buy food. And then he came to himself. That's it. You'll get it in a minute. I always like that when y'all are slow. The father said, or the boy said, Father, give me the portion of goods that followed to me. And he proved that he was a sinner and he proved that he was selfish. With a broken heart, the old dad gave the boy's inheritance and the boy took off into the far country. You know what happened to the far country? The Bible says he joined himself. He glued himself. Some of you are glued to the far country. You're glued to this old world. You're glued to the standards and the morals of this world. And it will happen to you just like it did to this poor boy. It took him all the way down to the hog pen. One day he came to himself and said, I don't deserve to be a son anymore, but I would rather be better off being a servant of my daddy than to live down here. That old boy came up out of the hog pen and he headed home. And there at the home place was his dad. The, the Bible says that it, he saw his son afar off and the, the boy got closer and the father went out to him and said, you sorry piece of plunder. You embarrassed me before my whole family. You embarrassed me in church. Don't you show your face around here. Go back where you came from. Is that what it says? No, because I just read it. No. Boy came back, he didn't deserve anything. He deserved judgment. He deserved hell. He starts making his apologies. Father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He couldn't even finish his speech because the Bible says the father put his arms around him and kissed him and put a robe on him and said, Son, welcome home. Welcome home. Now that's a grace-oriented family. There are times when all of us need forgiveness. Amen? There are times when we don't need what we deserve. There are times when transgressions are so great that forgiveness is difficult. The test is contrition and repentance. 
When there is genuine repentance and remorse over sin, there should be room in our families for genuine forgiveness and restoration. You look for that repentant part. In conclusion, musicians come. If you want to build a family with a firm biblical foundation, you need to have, number one, a God-oriented family. That gives family authority. You need to have a goal-oriented family. That gives family unity. And thirdly, you need to have a grace-oriented family. And that gives a family beauty. God gives authority. A goal gives unity. And grace gives beauty. What's going on in your family today? Are there needs that need to be addressed? Is there forgiveness that needs to be extended in your family? Are there confessions that need to be made? Do you need to come and pray for your family? Do you need to come to Jesus Christ for salvation? Are you a wayward son like the prodigal? Do you need to come home today? If there are needs in your family or in your life, there is help in Jesus. Amen. Come to Him today and receive the help that you need.